A little boy sits down to take a math test. His palms are a little bit sweaty, his heart is racing, and his body starts to produce cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And cortisol signals to his body to release more sugar into his bloodstream to fuel his brain. And two weeks later, whenever he gets his test back and he sees that A plus remark,、uh, his brain sends a little dose of dopamine, right, which results in a smile. Elsewhere, let's say Kansas, there is a stalk of corn, and a ladybug begins to nibble on it. And almost immediately, the plant starts to produce jasmonic acid, and the jasmonic acid gives the ladybug indigestion, which quickly stops it from eating any more corn.、Um, and the jasmonic acid also signals internally to the plant to start healing that wound. And these are both examples of chemical signaling, language that is built up of molecules that allows cells to interact with each other. And there are a lot of different dialects of chemical language.、Uh, there's pheromones, hormones, toxins, and many of these dialects are lipid-derived, meaning that the molecules are made from fats within the cell. And today I'm going to be telling you about oxylipin. Which is a chemical language that is lipid derived, and it's spoken by phytoplankton in the ocean, but it's also spoken within your cells as well. We'll start with a little bit of vocabulary. So, oxylipin means oxidized lipid. So, it's a fat that's had an oxygen added to it、uh, to become a new molecule, an oxylipin. And you actually know some of the words in this language already. How many of you have ever taken fish oil? Quite a few, right? It's, it's a pretty popular health supplement. So, fish oil、uh, contains eicosapentaenoic acid (EPA) and eicosahexaenoic acid (DHA), and it's fatty acids like this with multiple double bonds that form the basis of the oxylipin language. Now, EPA and DHA, while we extract them from fish,、uh, they do not come from fish. Fish cannot make these fatty acids.、Uh, they have to acquire them from the food that they eat, and so all DHA and EPA、um, in the ocean comes from phytoplankton. And phytoplankton come in a lot of different sizes and shapes and lineages. But we'll be focusing on these guys here, diatoms.、Uh, they're relatively large, but they're still microscopic.、Um, they produce、uh, glass cages called frustules that help to protect them. But they don't protect them entirely, and so as these diatoms get eaten, the EPA and DHA is passed up the food chain and eventually accumulates in fish. Now, why would a fish need fatty acids? Why would we need fatty acids? Why would any organism need a fatty acid? Well, one reason is because fatty acids make up an important component of the cell membrane. And you can think about the cell membrane as this film that separates the inside of the cell from the outside environment. And、uh, there's a lot of diversity in fatty acids that are within the cell membrane, and these fatty acids、um, form the basis of this oxylipin、uh, language. Now, when do diatoms start to speak oxylipin? Well, you remember that、uh, story that I told you about the corn getting eaten. Diatoms get eaten as well, and when they do,、uh, the fatty acids in their membrane get liberated, and enzymes modify them to produce oxylipins. So, diatoms—they、uh, have the major grazers of diatoms are single-celled grazers called microzooplankton. Micro meaning small, zo meaning animal, plankton meaning drifter. These microzooplankton they engulf the diatoms, so they swallow them whole. There are also larger grazers of diatoms, like copepods, which are very similar to shrimp.、Uh, the world's most famous copepod is the character plankton from SpongeBob SquarePants.、Uh, so you guys are familiar with this system; you've seen it before. Um, and both of these types of predation lead to oxylipin production, but death by、uh, grazer is not the only way that oxylipins get produced. Just like you and me, 
Uh, diatoms can be infected by viruses, and the viruses hijack the diatom's molecular machinery to make copies of themselves. And whenever the new viruses burst through the cell membrane, we get oxylipin production. Diatoms can also do to running out of nutrients、um, or old age, which for a phytoplankton is like a week. <laughs> And、uh, those both promote oxylipin production. So we can think about oxylipins like death cries. They are the last words of phytoplankton. And whenever I'm investigating this, I like to think of it like I'm investigating like a whodunit, right?、Um, this is the forensics of the ocean,、uh, CSI microbial loop. Can we decipher these death cries? What do they mean?、Uh, what I'll show you is that these death cries、um, ultimately、uh, provide protection and provision for future generations of diatoms. So there appears to be some sort of、uh, evolutionary incentive to do this, but you know, as we go to decipher these messages, what do they mean? What are they signaling? So for the microzooplankton grazers, oxylipins are inhibitory. So the oxylipins will actually decrease the rate at which these zooplankton go around engulfing their prey. And I've done experiments with my collaborators where we've fed zooplankton healthy diatoms, and we've fed them chronically stressed diatoms that are already producing some oxylipins. And what we see is that these single-cell grazers can detect these oxylipins, and they prefer the healthy diatoms ten to one. Um, copepods, on the other hand,、uh, they are not quite as discerning,、uh, but there are consequences for this. So, oxylipins cause mutations in the offspring of copepods, and actually can kill up to 70% of their eggs. So, you can see that this type of chemical signaling might、uh, keep the predator population at bay from year to year. There's also bacteria in the ocean, and bacteria respond to oxylipins differently depending on what their lifestyle is. So, free-living bacteria, bacteria that are just kind of floating out in the water column,、uh, they are、uh, inhibited by oxylipins. It's very poisonous, toxic to them. But bacteria that live attached lifestyles. Um, either on the surface of a diatom or another phytoplankton, or colonizing dead phytoplankton once they aggregate together,、um, they respond differently to oxylipins.、Um, in fact, they're stimulated by them. And so, what we see is that once the oxylipin signal is received, they increase their respiration, and then they start degrading that organic matter, that dead material that they're living on, much quicker. So, if you're a diatom, what is the advantage of whispering oxylipin to a bacteria as you're dying? Well, this increased respiration and increased degradation of this dead organic matter leads to recycling of nutrients, and these nutrients, like nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon, they can go on to fuel future phytoplankton blooms, and potentially one of your kin, right, helping to pass on your DNA. So this is really exciting, right? We have this chemical language that's orchestrating this intricate dance between all of these different cell types in the ocean. We have single-celled phytoplankton making the messages. We have single-celled grazers and multi-celled grazers responding. Single-celled bacteria and viruses even play a part. And for me, as a biological oceanographer. That's what I find interesting,、um, but I understand that chemical signaling between microorganisms in the ocean might not be everybody's cup of tea.、Uh, but there's a reason for you to care.、Uh, oxylipin is being spoken in your immune system. So oxylipins are produced whenever、uh, our bodies experience inflammation, and this could be due to like a wound, maybe you cut yourself. Um, a surgery, an infection、um, from bacteria or viruses,、um, and the oxylipins will help signal for the immune cells to leave your blood vessels and go to that site of inflammation in your body. Now, just like these microbial ecosystems in the ocean, your immune system is made up of lots of different cell types. 
and oxylipins specifically tell monocytes to come to the site of infection. And what they do is they can either turn into、um, a macrophage or a dendrocyte or another type of cell、um, that's involved in immune response. And the oxylipins specifically tell the monocytes to turn into a macrophage. Macrophage means big eater.、Um, and just like those single-celled grazers in the ocean, their job is to go around engulfing things. And so the macrophage will go to the site of infection and start to eat bacteria that maybe have infected the wound,、um, dead immune cells that have done their job and on their way out,、um, or engulf foreign bodies like maybe some dirt that's gotten into a cut. Now these monocytes,、um, they could also turn into dendrocytes, and dendrocytes are like the scouts of the immune system. And so they go out and they bind to bacteria or viruses, and then they report back to the immune system, so that custom immune cells can be produced to fight the infection. And as infection wraps up in our bodies, the oxylipins will signal to the dendrocytes, "Hey, we don't need you anymore. We've got this under control. Stop coming." And so the dendrocytes will stop coming to the site of infection, and then eventually the immune cells、um, that were tailor-made for that infection will disappear as well. And oxylipins are involved in、uh, a lot of different aspects of your immune system response. In fact, we know this system better than we know it in the ocean.、Uh, but I don't have time to tell you about all the different cells that oxylipins signal here. But again, they're orchestrating this intricate dance between all of these different cell types to defend your body. Think about it. This is chemical language that has been conserved across millions, maybe even billions of years, signaling between microbial ecosystems in the ocean and the immune system of your body, telling some cells, "Hey, come eat this," or "Stay away," or "I'm hurt," or "The plague is coming." And cells respond in kind, either passing on the message, or swimming away, or ramping up the molecular machinery to do metabolic work. And I think that if we can learn to speak oxylipin more fluently, then we can gain a much better understanding of microbial interactions in the ocean, as well as the evolution of chemical signaling and immune responses. Thank you.